Hello, and welcome to the Complicated Kids podcast. This is Gabrielle Nicolay, and today I am delighted, absolutely delighted, and we will never stop talking, um, <laughs> to have Marsha Miller here. Marsha, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm happy that you're here. Marsha is the Director of Mission, Admission and Social Emotional Learning at the Nora School. Mm -hmm. um, and Marsha, I'm going to let you tell the good folks like a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Nora School, the Nora School, and, yeah, and then we'll go from there. Great. I won't go too far. I won't, I won't take too much time. <laughs> I think first and foremost, I'm a mom and um, I had, a, ha, still have a complicated uh, kid, now adult. Um, and that really opened my eyes to the, the complications of having a student that's not perfect in an environment that always wants perfect children and perfect students and perfect uh, achievers. Um, and so that first and foremost brought what I bring to the Nora School really well because I can really identify with the parents when they are um, looking at the Nora School. And I can really identify with the students when they're here because um, what I love about the North School is we don't expect perfection. It's a great it's 9 through 12 high school. It's college prep um, with great writing program, great intellectual classes. Um, and I think that the rules and the way we teach and then we teach to the why really allows for students to kind of settle in and say, okay, this school makes sense. Um, I'm willing to do that paper, even though I don't like writing papers because there's a why behind it. Um, and then the complications of their life kind of settle down. Uh, school is no longer the big bully of the room um, and instead a place where it's a building that's easy to walk into um, and get help uh, whether it's quietly and, and quiet supports around you that you don't even know they're happening or more overt um, and, and so that that complicated student just gets to kind of be complicated without feeling like anything's wrong with them for being complicated and the parents feel the same way and that's huge because once you kind of feel comfortable with who you are um, that's uh, so much of the whole story. And so I kind of feel like I'm a complicated person too. My resume is hilariously long. I tried so many different jobs, so many different things, but with all those experiences, I take them to the Nora school. Uh, so I, it's my 11th year here. And I know when I interviewed, I was like, you know what, you're going to get somebody who has a lots of different experiences, but I had no idea how much of those experiences were going to come into play until I started working at the North School. I'm like so many different ways I can identify with what's going on um, in people's lives. Ooh, give me a for instance. Oh, Is there um, one that stands out? Well, um, let's see. Um, I mean, I can, the, I guess, you know, depression. I mean, I, I um, mm -hmm. somehow gathered a lot of information about depression and was able to figure out how to talk to somebody in a crisis moment. Mm. Um, and I really can't point to any one job that got me that experience, but for some reason, either the resilience I learned over the many jobs I had where I was thriving and maybe not so thriving mm -hmm. or whatever, I don't know what it is. It's like, I just keep mm -hmm. on thinking like, I've got these experiences that are coming out of nowhere, but I know they're built on so many of the experiences I've had in the past. So it's not a very clear cut example, but it's, it's one of those places where I keep on thinking, Hmm. Must have well, this what's so funny about what you're saying and what we were talking about right before we hit record is that you, <laughs> you are a very connected person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to tell the jury duty story because <laughs> I think, I think it's emblematic of number one, the type of person you are, but also the skills that you have and that you bring. And mm -hmm. then we'll jump to the other side of the equation, which is the kids. Right. Um, and so I moved everywhere in, in when I was growing up, um, about every three or four or five years we moved. My dad worked at General Motors and that's how you get promoted. So I think partly I was learning how to like, you land someplace new, you got to make friends. No one's going to do that for you. So by osmosis, I kind of learned how to do that. But also it's my personality style that, you know, if I'm standing in line in a grocery store or in this case, jury duty, I'll talk to anybody You're in front of me or behind me in line. I'll talk talk to the cashiers I talk to anybody and if somebody wants to talk back that's fine with me if they don't you know I'm like mm, all right fine a little rude but I, I'll live with it um and so in this case I had I was just going through a very recent uh, my husband ex had just decided to leave the marriage so I was kind of going through a lot um and so then I get jury duty I'm like great so I kind of go there and like we were saying it's like sometimes you're kind of grumbly about it before you walk in the door but you're also saying you know what I really do need to bring my best self to jury duty for the benefit of the person who needs me there. Um, 
So anyway, we're standing in line and it, in the DC courts, it's, it's, you're standing in long lines for almost everything, but in, in this case, jury duty every time. So I just started talking to the person in front of me, just haphazardly talking. And we, she and I started, she responded, which was great. And then we just started talking about how we would reinvent the jury duty system, um, how we would do different things. We were just connected. Um, and I was saying, I was like, you know, now that my husband's left, I want to get a cat. She's like, I've, I've got too many cats. I'm getting rid of my cats, you know, and, and we just made an instant friend. And she is actually now one of my most cherished friends. Um, all my friends know about my friend, this, this is my jury duty friend, because it's just such a great story. Like we just met so haphazardly but because we were willing to kind of be a little bit vulnerable but not too much it was just kind of we were willing to take a chance of talking to a stranger mm -hmm. um and the, the funniest part about that was that then when you finally get to the place place where you have to sign in you separate mm -hmm. and uh so i was like all right and so i get my my paperwork done and i take a deep breath i'm like all right look marcy <laughs> my nickname is marcy i'm like don't be bummed if now she's sitting there and she's you know got her head in a book that she doesn't want to talk anymore we talked a lot and maybe it was enough so it's okay i really literally had this little talk self-talk to myself it's gonna be okay <laughs> i walk out and i look down and she's waving at me she had saved me a seat beside her oh and God. so we always laugh about just how like you know we were very lucky to find each other but you know i i connect with so many different people and we were talking before the recording started it's like each person can give you something different and you mm -hmm. shouldn't expect any one thing from anyone mm -hmm person mm -hmm. but that if you have enough people around you and enough resources and enough different ways to connect with people then you can have a, so much more of a balanced life because you are not relying on any one person to do everything for you or be everything what's interesting to me about this story as regards complicated kids orchid kids mm -hmm. whatever diagnosed whatever <laughs> we want to call them right mm -hmm. um highly sensitive mm -hmm. is is actually that you weren't this kind of kid yeah. because, and here's how I know, which is you said when you move around a lot, you just kind of have to get to know people, right. which is exactly what somebody who is present in their body, not being triggered by a lot of sensory stimuli, not being taken aback by academic content, right? right? Where the, the thing that you, that you, that you contend with that that five-year-old contends with is, okay, these are new people. How am I going to get connected, right? Yeah. How am I going to connect with these other people? And you have been able throughout your life mm -hmm. to take that with you. Now, the, for the child and the children, teenagers, whatever they are, when they get to you, who come to Nora, they have had a lifetime of a completely different experience. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so they have, and many, or this is true of many orchids, mm -hmm. many complicated kids where they are constantly up against feelings of disconnection. Yeah. Even from the people who are supposed to, and again, I'm putting it, supposed yeah. to in air quotes, right? Supposed to be able to address their needs. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to talk about sort of what you see there? There's a lot of people that think that they are their connections. Um, and, and I don't pretend to, to say, I mean, I, I'm very lucky. I used to be a real wallflower, so I wasn't, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. But um, I am lucky in that I don't, I mean, I, I got I got kicked out of a click in eighth grade and I still remember it. Mm -hmm. um, it there's there, You can have some really bad experiences. And for some reason, I was just given a great centerpiece of my of myself that I was like, mm -hmm. You know, I, it was a horrible year. And I, like I said, I still at my age, still very much remember that, but, um, it, it is something that you either choose to learn from or choose to not let it define you, or, you know, you are more of a complicated person where it does stick on you. Um, and so when I talk to, um, my, my admission students and also when they come to Nora, it's like, it really does take a lot of. I don't know, self-awareness, but also self-love of being able to really just say, I, I'm going to have to take that chance with this new person. Now, at Nora, it also allows us, um, we talk a lot about that fresh start. And um, so changing a school for a high school where the kindness is a huge aspect of our environment, you can walk in and throw a lot of those things off of your shoulders. I know you can't see me, but I'm 
moving my shoulders alone, throwing that cape off, that you don't have to, no one remembers that you threw up on Mrs. White's shoes in third grade. No one remembers that, you know, you got in trouble in a click in in, in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. You get to be yourself again and you kind of get to reinvent. And I, I will say that all those moves allowed me to reinvent myself constantly. That's super that interesting. Huge. Yes, yes, yeah. agreed. Okay, so yeah. clean slate kind and of opportunity for yeah. success again. Yeah. And life mm -hmm. does give you a lot of those opportunities for clean slates or, or, and reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, most certainly from middle school to high school to college, there are ways where you can just like walk into a new dorm and just say, this is who I'm going to be this time. Mm -hmm. um, as long as it's still genuine enough. Right. <laughs> you I had get... a friend in college who <laughs> had a, a two-part name. Her name was Mary Jane. And she was from California and she came to college on the East coast and all of her friends in California were like, no, 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 no. Your, your name is too long for those East Coast folks. You're going to have to change it. So she was MJ at college. Yeah. She was MJ at college and she is Mary Jane in all of the other environments in her life, except for her college friends. So funny. And she listened to them. I was like, all right, I'll be MJ. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And I think that that you know that takes me on the side note of what I love about this generation is that they are exploring gender, they are exploring identity, and they're exploring their names and their pronouns. And and so a lot of that also is a kind of a clean slate that I get to really be who I truly feel who I am deep down. Mm -hmm. And I love that there's a, a whole new sense of awareness in this this newest generation of of teenagers that I'm pretty impressed with mm -hmm. that they they are really very much more um, aware of mental health and and, um, and really identity um, as they explore it. And some some you know sometimes you you're born you know exactly who you are. I'm not saying everybody's exploring it, um, but I just love the idea that everyone that this generation is much more open to people who are figure out who they are. Yeah. So there's probably not one answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. When a when a ninth grader comes to Nora from a lifetime of academic failure or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Give us a, give us a picture of like, what, what is that social and academic profile and what is the goal, hope, best case scenario for that student? Right. So, you know, it's so much about the right fit because you don't want to put a person who has you don't want to put a person in ninth grade English if they're not ready for ninth grade English. Now mm -hmm. we have a little bit of a, it's a small classroom of no more than 12 kids. So we have a little bit of ability to, to reach a further range of grade appropriate uh, than maybe, you know, the, the, the AP style classes, but we really do kind of talk a lot in the admissions process to make sure the fits right. Because the last thing I want is for a student to land at Nora and then have that happen again. Yep. Now, they will have issues academically if they've had academic issues all their life. And, um, but, you know, we, I just like never know. We had to, we take students who are, are, you know, the, the public school system says that they are way below grade level in math. And we're like talking about what that's going to look like at Nora school. And then maybe you need tutors and maybe you're going to need, we don't know what we're going to do if you can't do algebra one, because that's our earliest math. And then the kid comes in and just does fine. And, and all just, of a sudden they're feeling confidence because we're teaching it in a way that makes sense to the student. So we put so many accommodations in our classrooms that all of a sudden it's kind of like the elementary school teachers that put those, they're teaching a wide range of learners, mm -hmm. right? The elementary school mm -hmm. teachers are so open to like, oh, that's a verbal learner. Oh, that's an audio learner. Oh, that's a kinetic learner, a kinesthetic learner. And uh, then middle school and high school just kind of be like, everybody's a one size, one style size learner. Mm -hmm. Get up and just pay attention. It's so interesting what you're yeah. what you're talking about, and and it occurs to me that like th this is this is not news to anybody who thinks about this, but the through line here is always regulation. Oh my gosh, self regulation, <laughs> oh, yeah. co regulation, and just kind of general regul. Keep mm -hmm. having a body and a brain that can stay in um discrimination mode Ooh, I like learning that. mode long enough to learn something new rather yeah. than phoom, going into you know and dan Siegel has it. this gorgeous right. hand brain model that like as soon as the prefrontal cortex goes offline now we're in lizard brain and right. all of our protective instincts and we we don't learn we don't even hear much no. actually there's some really interesting research about um voice frequencies Ooh do not reach the brain in the same way. They're attenuated 
when the brain is in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Yeah. Wow. That's, that does make sense though. I mean, it's kind of like, right? kind of obvious, but yeah. I never well, I know, but, and so interesting, all this neuroscience yeah. is like so interesting because it bears out what we see clinically, which is right. like, kids are terrified. They're frozen in place. They mm-hmm. can't function right. until you bring them down okay. and set the conditions mm-hmm. by which, okay, now we can start to feel safe mm-hmm. and then oh we can gosh. start to connect. Yeah, but I can't, I can't thank you enough for saying that because it's like, you have to feel safe. You have to feel like you can relax. And so a lot of our kids come to Nora in ninth, 10th and 11th grade. Um, and I'm always like, look, if they were ang- it, they were stressed, right? They were stressed for some reason mm-hmm. and they're not learning. So we are always looking for those missing gaps and identifying what's most essential. So like you said, like even if they've had academic failures, we're kind of just filling in the gaps. We're not expecting that they kids going to know everything by the time they graduate, but they will be at a, the academic correct place for college. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really all about the confidence you learn once you are relaxed in a classroom. And so many kids have said that, that, you know, and I, we had our 50th anniversary, we're coming up on our 65th now, but we had our 50th anniversary and I, um, all right, it must, it must've been 55 anyway, um, because I was there. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, student came up or a young man came up to me and said, you don't know me because you weren't here when I was here, but I was awful at math. I couldn't do math. I hated math. I absolutely could not do math. And now I'm just finishing up my PhD in math. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Congratulations. This is all you guys. It was everything about what you did at NOR that allowed me to actually listen and learn and realize I could do math. Hmm. And I, I don't, you know, I, I bet my, I bet the math teacher at the time would be like, I didn't do anything. Right. But it was just the more relaxed environment, the lower pressures, the lower feeling like of, of competition. You're not competing against your peers. You're getting one-on-one attention that's based on who you are and what kind of learner you are. All of a sudden your brain's like, oh, okay, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. So this approach in general, like in the general, whatever atmosphere of Western civilization and Washington DC civilization in general too, is like, isn't that the opposite? Like, isn't isn't leaning out and getting expansive about what a kid needs the opposite of what we want. They need to do the work. (laughs) And yet, you know, it's so funny because you guys are, are, you begin in ninth grade, right? By that time, you can make a very easy point to whoever needs to hear it that like, you've been trying this other thing for quite some time, right? Like that clearly hasn't worked. Yes. And so now we're going to try something different. Are you cool with that? Maybe through no fault of your own, right? right? Because the brain only knows how to just say it must be us. You know, I used to be a smart kid in elementary school. Now I can't do anything in middle school because I don't have it. And the brain does not know, oh, we don't have the executive function yet to be able to to, do deadlines or writing papers. Mm -hmm. The brain has no idea. All it knows is that all of a sudden I'm looking around like, man, I know I used to be smarter than that kid over there, but now they're getting A's and I'm getting C's. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? Yep. So that self-confidence takes such a brutal hit. And then all they're hearing is just try harder. <laughs> Pay attention more. Um, you know, just do the work and you'll be and you'll you'll do fine. And there's a huge chasm inside the brain of an ADHD person. Mm-hmm. There's a huge chasm in the side of a brain that doesn't have the, that particular executive functional executive function wiring yet now the good news about executive function is it's going to happen we just don't know when um and adhd you just learn how to manage it um but your brain has not known why it's no longer working um and it's a horrible place to be so oftentimes when we talk to kids who've had a lot of academic um non-success it's really because no one has really figured out how to actually teach in a large 30 person classroom to that student Mm-hmm. And to no fault to the teachers either. There's a mm-hmm. whole system that's just not in place for a student like that. That's right. So in a 12 person classroom with kid, teachers who really understand ADHD, um, we're teaching chunking, we're teaching time management, we're slowing and calming the process down. And that way we can actually go deeper. Mm-hmm. So I proffer that we're actually more intellectual than many classes, but we are calmer pace. So I can take kids with a very high IQ, but slow processing speed. Mm-hmm. That same student in an AP honors class at the really high end schools in this area are miserable and they don't know why, because its brain does not know how to say, oh, we might have a slower processing speed. 
<laughs> Let's check that out, right? And it's not until someone knows enough to be able to take them for a neuropsych testing that that shows up, right? I mean, my my daughter didn't get tested until college. Oh, wow. I kept saying, I think you have ADHD, but I don't know much about it. I had no idea I had it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I'm like, well, let's try this and let's try that. And in college, when she was really struggling, I was like, all right, that's it. We're getting tested. Mm -hmm. By then I knew enough. Um, and then it was a, a huge, huge aha moment of like brilliant in this and crazy low press, crazy 1% in these other places. Mm -hmm. No wonder school was hard. Yeah. Um, but you now have no confidence. I think I took you off track. You were asking. No, not at all. We're completely but, on track. Yeah. I wanted to ask you because, <laughs> because you have these admissions conversations with the kids, but you're also um, kind of in charge of social emotional learning, which yeah. is, I think, part of this too, right? When we feel like the world isn't safe for us, um, then we go kind of, we go into fight, flight, or freeze, or fawn is the new one. Do you know about this? Oh, yeah. People pleasing, I, I, extreme people pleasing. And for, for, for kids who show up at Nora and certainly for many complicated kids, they get that works for some amount of time and then it stops working because the things that they're being asked to do are too hard. Right. And so they can't please. Um, and then they just go to fight or flight. But yeah. some of that looks like poor social skills. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So how do you what's your what's your thinking on that? Yeah, we, we, it's, I always say anxiety looks like a lot of other things. Um, and so, um, you know, I just think that we keep on just taking that individual approach, sitting down with that teacher and said, sitting down with that student and saying, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And they were quiet and we listen. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just let that student just say, I don't know, you know, and, and finally they're going to come up with something mm -hmm. like, I just, I just, you know, i I feel like whenever we do this, I am sure I can't. And therefore I'm like, so what if we did something different? Hmm. Now we can, at Nora, we can't go too off the beaten path. We're, we're a college prep high school that's small. That's kind of our, <laughs> you know, we can do a lot of things with that, but that's, we're not a special ed school, but a lot of special ed schools can definitely do it in more. Mm -hmm. But it's really, we're led by that student. We're, we try something new and we, and we go with maybe what they're thinking um, and with a, with their own ability to have a say, mm -hmm. a voice that's actually being heard and listened to and responded to. So I might be like, well, we can't say no homework at all, but we can reduce it here and we can improve it there. Like we can go deeper with you there if you feel like you're not being tasked enough, but I know you don't want more homework. Um, and so we can kind of try and figure out what might work with that student. The way, because we take an individualized approach that really does help a lot. Um, and then I think our teachers also just try different things in the classroom for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so and, interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about, um an interview I did with Katina Sweetie from Embark mm -hmm. School, not Embark Behavioral Health, okay. but Embark School, where they let the students basically run the place, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a fascinating model, but it, and it, it's obviously not the same thing as, as what you're doing, but it is a very whole person centered mm -hmm. approach, which is right. like, you have information about yourself, and I have information about you and education and, and what the requirements are right. and let's work together, figure something out from here, right. Figure something out yeah. rather than what they've been told their whole lives, which is you need to do this and you should be doing this better. And why can't you just right. These programs laid out right in front of you? Why can't you just do it the way I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. And the, and, and there's a thousand different things that are happening in that person's brain when you say those things. First and foremost, shame, right? Yes, I really wish I could. <laughs> I, would, I would make this a lot easier for myself if I could. Thank you very much. Why do you think I'm sitting here? <laughs> right, and what is the upside to me not being able to do this? Oh, because I really can't. Because <laughs> okay, I'd really great. rather be struggling. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and, and that, the whole small school model is, is mm -hmm. based on that. Um, much more of an individual, because we can, a much more individual process mm -hmm. um and so and then you look at like fusion which is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mm -hmm. very different place but sometimes a great landing place for a student who is struggling in school mm -hmm. um and needs to be in a place where it's just a complete reboot mm -hmm. um and then there's the micro schools to the small schools like nora to the medium and larger where you're going to go back into more of a competitive um expectation school Mm -hmm. For good reasons. I mean, a lot of these schools are very, very good schools, but it's you know, for the right fit. 
Um, this yeah. is what I tell people on who are looking at preschools. Like, yeah. what's the best preschool for my kid? Well, it depends on who your kid is. Yeah. What do yeah. they What do they want? What do they need? What's good for them? How do you feel when you walk into the school? Yeah. Um, right. One of the things. How, I does, say, your, how yeah. does your little preschooler feel when they walk in the school? They yeah. actually do have an idea. My daughter chose her first grade um, school because she said in the first in the kindergarten class they have little size school. Uh, chairs mm-hmm. and that means the school understands little kids and i was like she said that i had a quite a precocious child yeah you did <laughs> like that was pretty cool right and i thought you know what they're looking for is very different than i me as a mother i go how are you teaching the, the early reading skills like that's not her that's not her thing yeah. <laughs> was like do i feel comfortable here yeah right yeah. i mean i i do you know there's always these parenting styles that come and go in different popularities right i always worry that I, I added to my daughter's anxiety, right? As a mother, you're just always going to do that. You're always going to yeah. go down that path. Mothers and fathers just relax. Yeah. You know, you probably did some and you, and, and you probably didn't do others. Um, but listening to a child, um, and really letting them have a full say and not always doing what they say, mm-hmm. but listening to them and engaging. I really think that that's the best thing you can do in life is listen to somebody else. Mm-hmm clarify what they're saying right it's it's a it's a therapy 101 kind of thing you know but that's part one of connection too right it's like i I recognize you right it's very avatar i see you (laughs) the being in me sees the being in you yes yes and from there now we're connected and the specifics don't matter that much. Right. They really right. don't. And here's the, 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 I think the caveat for, it's mostly parents who watch this is like, we're so hooked on like, but I know what they need and I know what they need to do. And, or, and I know that the world is not going to forgive them for being who they are. It's okay. Mm-hmm. The most important thing in a person's life is that they feel connected. And you started to say something, I wanna circle back to that for just a second, is like, maybe it's not gonna be the same person that you're connected to. Maybe you need different people for different things. Mm -hmm. And yet also having one is pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, having one important one is really good. mm -hmm. Um, But you know, I think in parenting, you have to, as you go into the middle and then high school years, you are starting at this point at Bill Sticks, we wrote a great book um, with Ned Johnson about, um, but one of the, I can't. The self-different child. Yeah. And there's another one. What to say or something like that. And it's somewhere in there. um, Fantastic books. Everybody should read them. They are great. And and we have them as speakers often. They're great to listen to on our parent education series because they're just, they've got these great gems of parenting. But one of the things to know in the middle school, but especially in the high school years, is that you're now becoming a consultant instead of the manager, right? So in kindergarten, you are a micromanager. I know it's right for my child, um, even though I, I definitely do still say the child should have some say, right? But in middle school and high school, you're still you're still sure you know what's right for your child. But now if they don't have buy in, it's not going to work. And so all of a sudden now you are really being much more of a consultant. What can we do to help you make these decisions? Mm -hmm. What can we do to help you succeed in whatever the way that makes sense for you? Mm -hmm. Um, And all of a sudden as and you let them get that skinned knee, which is from another another um person blessing of the skinned knee oh yeah. um wendy mogul is that it yeah i think so um, i don't remember that yeah. sorry if it's not the right author um the blessing of the skinny they have to they have to get the skin knee on their own yeah. and your in your intent as a parent is like but i know better i can tell you how to avoid that skin knee by just walking to the right instead of the left mm-hmm. and they have to walk to the left they have <laughs> to do it just and and then they have to learn and when they learn it mm-hmm. i think one of the hidden problems of parenting is that when you keep telling them to take that right turn to avoid skin knee mm-hmm. what you're inherently telling them this is my own viewpoint um is that you're telling them that you don't really trust them mm-hmm. you don't really think they can do it mm-hmm. um uh, and my daughter definitely told me that you know and i was like all right i as the last thing i was intending to do i was just trying to give you the benefit of my wisdom um but instead i was somehow conveying that i just didn't think she could figure this out on her own yeah. and yeah. as soon as i started letting her have much more say and much more way of making mistakes that weren't mm-hmm. life changing mm-hmm. or health driven you know mm-hmm. or, or you know it's scary yep um all of a sudden she gained confidence because mm-hmm. she she knew that i believed in her yeah 
mean, I could say that all of the along, but until I kind of let go and become the, became the consultant, that's when she kind of grew into her own. And so that's one of my best pieces of advice Mm -hmm. um, for complicated kids, especially. It's so interesting because right. Resilience. Everybody says they want their their kids to be resilient, but nobody wants their kids to struggle. (laughs) Right. It's like, you can't build resilience without without struggle. And, um, and the thought just flew out of my head. I'm going to keep talking for just a second. When we, we, we basically cut them off at the knees mm-hmm. if we don't allow them to find their own way. And then you're right. We're, we're basically neutering their entire experience yeah. and telling them they're not, they're not capable. Right. And um, then you're there when things go wrong mm-hmm. with, with, you know, very few questions asked, mm-hmm. you're there to help them. Mm-hmm. They start realizing that your role is still very much supportive, mm-hmm. but in a newly designed way. And so all of a sudden they are encountering life and they are going to make good decisions because they know that you let them have some breathing space. Yeah. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. What we're what we've just been discussing is different from repeated failure right. on multiple fronts because you're not getting, because you don't have the skill or the demands are 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 not commensurate with your yeah. skill, right? And so repeated failure over time is Very what different. we've been talking about here in terms of like, how do kids end up like basically traumatized academically, yeah. right? Versus we call it a just right challenge over mm-hmm. at Raising Orchid Kids, right? Which is like, what is the next rung of that ladder that mm-hmm. they can reach? Can I put you to it mm. without being too much mm-hmm. you know and i'm exactly. there fall but i don't say that because i don't want you to think i'm i think you're gonna fall and it's so complicated yeah. it's complicated raising a complicated chap yeah it's complicated but i agree with you 100 percent, gabriel i think that the idea that if you're starting to see themes <laughs> and repeats that's certainly not the same of like well you know you're gonna still have to skin those knees right it's like no that, that poor child is trying their best right. and they don't know alternative ways of figuring this situation out and at that point then you do have more conversations with the adults in their life the teachers the admin the uh, you know neuropsych testing really will give you some great aha moments mm-hmm. you know, money notwithstanding and so it those kinds of things allow you to put better supports in place Yep. to then help that child start to get new routes yep. of then taking those new, um, you know, skin knees. But yep. yeah, that's a very good point. And what we're getting is a lot of kids who feel like I mean, I have tried that before. I've tried everything. Mm-hmm. What possibly could you say that's going to be different? Mm-hmm. And I just keep talking. I'm like, we accept you. Mm-hmm. We accept you for who you are. All we ask is that you come to school, you're in class, you're listening that to us means you're engaged, but once you become even more engaged, you're actually going to enjoy, your brain's going to be happier. Mm-hmm. All we ask is that you come to us as a, as your genuine self, as long as you're nice, bright, or redirectable. Anybody who's talked to me at the North school is like, oh my gosh, there we go. She, there she goes, that nice, bright, and redirectable again. But I, that's how I define our, our community. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you're nice, it works. As long as you're bright, you're going to be fine. We'll, we'll help you and we'll get you over these difficult subjects and, and projects. And if you're redirectable, that discussion-based class can work. Mm-hmm. Now, can right. we pull you aside and kind of adjust, tweak a little bit of here and there what your behavior is, maybe a little less talking, maybe a little more talking, a little this and all that. That works as long as you can lean in and let us kind of tweak it with you and, and you're willing to tweak. Right. Um, and uh, But that, that whole thing of um, just being allowed to be yourself <laughs> and, and like you said in the beginning, just that centered balance of, Mm-hmm. that's who I am right mm-hmm. and they will do fine in, as, a, as an adult mm-hmm. Wait a minute. I, again I'm happy with this generation but I'm also happy to see a lot more careers being opened up to people who are pretty far along on this autism spectrum mm-hmm. um, or disabled in many different ways either um, cognitively or or physically and and there's just so much more of an openness to what people can bring to the table yeah. um, so what we keep on saying is like be okay with who you are and focus on the things that you can focus on. Right. And don't focus on the things you don't do well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love it. Connection, yeah. self-acceptance, Connection, all yeah. the things. Yeah. Because when you connect with other people, you're also connecting with who they are because mm-hmm. you're not expecting you to, um, they don't have to be perfect in all ways to you. Right. Right. 
You look. Well, this is so funny, and yeah. I'm gonna, we're gonna we're gonna stop in just a second here because yeah. we could go all day. But <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> it is funny that for many people, they would agree that the voice inside their head says really mean things. Oh my gosh. Things that we would never dream of saying to another person. Right. And yet we think it's okay to like have this internal monologue that like just beats up on ourselves all the time. That's so true. It's a funny like thing that our brains do to us, right? It's like completely acceptable as long as it's internal, but we would never dream of saying that to someone else. We don't think other people should do that. And and those, right. And those same traits are fine in my friend. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. But completely unacceptable in me. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Hard. Marcia, so thanks hard. for being here. Oh my gosh, Gabrielle. I enjoyed it so much. And I hope this was helpful to the people who listen. Um, just knowing that you're not supposed to be perfect. I just, it's the biggest takeaway and connecting yeah. with many different people to get help. Including people, the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, if people are curious about the Nora School, what should they do? Absolutely. If they go on our website, noraschool.org, um, they can find me that way. They can call our number. They can, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll talk with just about anybody who wants to find out what's going on. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Everybody, again thank you so much for helping, having me here. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank Bye. you. Bye.